it's a privilege to share God's word with, with us all. It's, what I'm about to say is not anything that you have not heard before, just kindly reminders, maybe a different speaker, different presenter, but I trust that as we go through uh, this message, that God will bless us. And so I must thank our sister for the scripture reading and Sister Eve for your kind words of introduction. Our passage of meditation is taken from Hosea chapter 11. And I just want to go into a, the background of the passage. So the Lord says, when, I, when Israel was a child, I loved him and called him out of Egypt as my son. But the more I called him, the more he turned away from me. My people sacrificed to Baal. They burnt incense to idols. Yet I was the one who taught Israel to walk. I took my people up in my arms but they did not acknowledge that I took care of them. I drew them to me with affection and love. I picked them up and helped them, held them to my cheek. I bent down to them and fed them. Verse five, Hosea 11. They refused to return to me. And so they must return to Egypt and Assyria will rule them. War will sweep through their cities and break down the city gates. It will destroy my people because they do what they themselves think best. Verse seven, they insist on turning away from me. They will cry out because of the yoke that is on them, but no one will lift it from them. How can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? Could I ever destroy you as I did Adma or treat you as I did Zebulun? My heart will not let me do it. My love for you is too strong. And so God went on to say in Hosea 11 to his children in verse nine, I will not punish you in my anger. I will not destroy Israel again for I am God and not a human being. But this is from the, the People Good News Bible. I, the Holy One, am with you. I will not come to you in anger. Verse 10, my people will follow me when I roar like a lion at their enemies. They will hurry to me from the West. And verse 11, they will come from Egypt as swiftly as birds and from Assyria like doves. I will bring them to their homes again. I, the Lord, have spoken. So God gave, God loved Israel and brought them out from their bondage in Egypt, more than 500 years before the time of Hosea. However, they did not like the messages that God gave them through the prophets. So they departed from God and served other gods. The idolatry of Baals called to Israel and they forsook the Lord and followed the Baals. God cherished Israel, but they soon forgot how he brought them out of Egypt and what he had done for them. Northern Israel would experience a bondage in Assyria, similar to the one they had experienced in Egypt because they refused to return to God. They could not avoid war and invasion of Assyria because of their own misguided counsels. Verse 11, the background says, no one could free them from their bondage because they were habitually backsliding from God. God's heart turns over in pain because of his love for Israel. He says, how shall I give you up? How shall I deliver you, o Israel? If only Israel would repent, God would not destroy them because he is the Holy One in their midst. Ellen White says, holiness 
is wholeness, total devotion. Our holiness is total devotion to God. God's holiness is his perfect devotion to us. Even in Hosea's time, God still loved sinful Israel, but with deep pain, hoping for their return to walk with him. Today's message is presented under the caption, stubborn love. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name this evening, O oh dear God, we come before you asking that you will wash us thoroughly from our sins. Remove everything within and without and from around us that will hinder you from blessing us. And as we come, oh dear God, empty us of self, pour out your spirit and bless us. Touch me, oh loving Father, with a life call from thine divine altar so that my words, oh God, may penetrate every barrier and set us free. And he that is set free is free indeed. Speak. Through me now, I pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Stubborn love. Stubborn Amen. means having or showing steadfast determination not to change one's attitude or position on something, especially in spite of good arguments or reasons to do so. Stubborn means holding your ground, standing firm with whatever you are convicted with. God's love for us this evening is stubborn. And I'm so happy that God has this quality of love extended to us. There is no force more powerful than the love our Heavenly Father has for us. His love, God's love can move mountains. God's love can stop the roaring sea. God's love healed broken bones and mend wounded hearts. God's love dries the mourner's tears. God's love stopped funeral processions. God's love restored a sight, speech, and hearing. God's love has and still transforms lives. God's love breaks shackles and frees those held captive by sin and shame. So great is his love for you and for me that he sent his only son to die that we might live through him. That's not to be taken lightly. Jesus came and died that we might live through him. Living through him is not merely existing. It's more than existing. It's deep rooted when we are alive in Christ. It, it means to me that when we live through him, dead situations can live again. When we live through him, severed relations, relationships can live again. Unfulfilled dreams can come alive through him. That's what living through him means. Dormant plans can live through him. Even though we have committed the worst mistakes in our lives, the stubborn love of God for his children never changes. This was a message that the Heavenly Father wanted to send to Israel through the prophet Hosea. God does not love you or God does not love me for, for who we are or for what we have done. God loves us for who he is. As we reflect on the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, think of that youngest son, the younger one who was in the house of the father. He was loved and still he wanted his share of the inheritance. He, he goes, spends everything, reaches the lowest level, far from the father. And when he had reached the bottom, he feels the nostalgia of the warmth of his father's house and returns. What about the father? Had he forgotten his son? 
never. He is there. He sees him from afar. He was waiting for him every day, every second, every moment. He has always been the heart as a son. Even when he had abandoned his, his father and his home, even when he had squandered all that he had, which included his freedom, he was still in the father's heart. The father with patience and love, with hope and mercy, had never stopped thinking about his son. That's how God operates with us. That's the stubborn love this afternoon, this evening we ought to celebrate. The father with patience and love, with hope and mercy, had never stopped thinking about the prodigal son. As soon as he saw him still distant, he runs to meet with him runs to embrace him with tenderness, the tenderness of God, without a word of reproach. Without a word of reproach, he has embraced his son. That is the joy of the father in the embrace of the son. Parents today and, and relatives and friends, when, when our loved ones astray and they go contrary to our, our liking, some of them cannot return. And perchance we allow them to. There is a long sermon. There is a lot of, of, of condemnation and criticizing, but this father ran and embraced his son no reproach. He was happy that his son returned home. It's extremely important for us to know the love God has for us. You may ask why. Why must we know about the importance of God's love? If we do not, if, if we do not understand the depth, the height and the breadth of God's love, we will sink deep into despair. And Satan will use the opportunity to cause us to live in fear. When we, when we fail to understand that God loves us in spite of, when we fail to understand that, that God says, come let us reason together. Though you are messed up and soiled and tattered and torn, I love you. If we fail to understand God's stubborn love, Satan will use that opportunity to cause us to live in fear. But God says he has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Song of mine, Psalm 34 verse 4 says, I saw the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Satan will use the opportunity to cause us to doubt God's forgiveness. But for as John 1 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Glory be to God. If we fail to understand how much God loves us, Satan will cause us to feel like failures. But Psalm verse 30, chapter 37, verses. 23 and 24 says, the Lord directs the, the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fail. Are you hearing me this afternoon? Though we stumble, we will never fail for the Lord holds them up by their hands. If we fail to understand God's stubborn love, we will want to give up like many have done in times past. But God says in Philippians 1, 1, 6, being confident of this, that he who has begun a good work in you, hallelujah, will carry it on to the completion until the day of Jesus Christ's return. If we fail to understand how much God loves us and the price he has paid for us, we will be discouraged. 
but for us chronicles i have good news for us chronicles 22 verse 30 says be strong and courageous do not be afraid or dismayed or discouraged if we fail to understand god's stubborn love we will feel insecure but Proverbs 14, 26 says, those who fear the Lord are secure. What an amazing God we serve. When we fail to understand how much God loves us, we will feel condemned. But Romans 8, 1 and 2 says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. There is no condemnation. Those who fail to understand the quality of God's love, those of us who fail to understand the magnitude of God's love, we will feel unworthy because of, we are repeated offenders. But Isaiah 41 verse 10 says, fear thou not. For I am with thee, be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. It is so difficult for man to understand the essence of God's love that Hosea had to marry a prostitute so that Israel could understand the missive. Just as many today fail to understand the immensity of God's grace and mercy on his children. We have failed God over and over again. We have sinned. Many have gone astray, but a message is still proclaimed today. Do you know why? Because God still loves you. God still loves me. God still loves us. Are you feeling unworthy? Call upon Jesus. The price has already been paid. God is the epitome of love. God's perfect love embraces the worst in me. What love? What stubborn love? How deep the Father's love for us. God always wants and always waits for us. He does not get tired. Are you tired and weary? Have you almost lost your way? God is able. He is never tired. Jesus expresses the mercy and patience of God. When we truly embrace the magnitude of God's stubborn love, we will accept the forgiveness and cleansing. When we truly understand the magnitude of God's stubborn love, we will know that we are accepted and loved. We will, we will be hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. Can you really fathom the love of this magnificent God we serve? Oh, love that will not let me go. This hymn, hymn 76 in the Adventist hymnal. As a boy, George Matheson had partial vision. And after he began attending Glasgow University, he became totally blind at age 18. Talking about the, 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 the person that put his song together, George Matheson. There's a popular, a, a popular account on why George wrote this, uh, this song. His fiance left him because before their marriage, when she found out, he would soon be totally blind. So on the evening of June 6, 1882, George said, his account, something happened to me, George said, which was known only to myself and which caused me the most severe mental suffering. The hymn was the fruit 
of that suffering. Oh, love, that will not let me go. I rest my weary soul in thee. I give thee back the life I owe, that in thine ocean depths its flow may richer, fuller be. Oh, light, that followeth all my way. I yield my flickering torch to thee, and, and this flickering torch is its broken heart. My heart restores its borrowed rays, that in thy sunshine's blaze its day may brighter, fairer be. George, who was going through a, a deep stage of depression, God intervened in that room as his sister left that evening. That, that evening, his sister, who was his helper, got married. So George alone was at home and went through this, this personal suffering. And then the last stanza say, oh, cross that lifteth up my head, I dare not ask to fly from thee. I lay in dust, life's glory dead, and from the ground there blossoms red, life that shall endless be. This song took five minutes to compose. This afternoon, as we, as we understand how much God loves us, I want us to examine some characteristics of God's love that we ought to emulate and reciprocate. We ought to share uh, four characteristics of God's love. God's love is everlasting, from everlasting to everlasting. Psalm 103 verse 17 says, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. And of those who fear him and his righteousness to his children's children, let's love longer. Can we commit? Can we commit this evening to loving longer and deeper? Let's look past the issues and see a precious soul in need of our love, in need of our attention, in need of our forgiveness. We are so wretched most times, yet God loves us. Romans 8, 35 asks the question, what can separate us from the love of God? Can, can our past, can our past mistakes, can, can, can our repeated offense, as, as, as the, the, the song that was sung earlier, can, can we really do anything to, to outdo God's love for us? Romans asks the question in verse 35 of Romans, says, what can separate us from the love of Christ? Verse 38, and I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life. Neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Verse 39, no power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Brothers and sisters, let us never lose confidence in the the patient mercy of God. Many persons are driven to despair because they cannot understand. They cannot fathom the love that God has for them. Just one week ago in my, my homeland, beautiful land of Guyana, this young man, he, he I, I do not know what was his trouble, his trouble, but he he was driving his, his motorcycle, riding on, on, on a bridge that, that spanned the, the, the widest river, the Demerara River. And on that bridge, he stopped, parked his bike, and plunged to his death. Whatever he was going through was more than him. If we can only understand how much God loves us, there is nothing that we can ever do to separate us from his love. And that's why when we see young people and, and going astray, let us just embrace them with love. Let us just speak words of love and encouragement because they are suffering. We too, we are suffering. Many times the, the trials and the difficulties seem to, to suppress us. But if we only understand how much God loves us, then we wouldn't lose hope. Let us, let us be intentional about our love. God is not like us. He is patient. We often want everything immediately, but God is patient. 
So they, this, this afternoon, I'm asking that we love longer and deeper. I want the Lord to touch me and teach me how to love like him. Second characteristic, God's love has expression. How is, how is that, us with expressing love? How are you doing with expressing your love and, and care and affection for those in your family, for colleagues, for some miserable, disgusting relative or um, neighbor <laughs> or friend? Are, are, we, are we selective or are we refusing to express familiar text from John chapter three, verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates, we talking about expressing God's love. God's love is expressive. You cannot have God's love and keep it to yourself. It's impossible. It's like fire in the bones. We cannot shut in God's love. God is too big for us to shut him in. And so God's love is expressive. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love towards us in that while. That's why he said, come as you are. While we were yet meddling in sin and doing our own thing, Christ died for us. We, how can we express? We can express our love by being kind and caring in spite of. Sometimes we are not in the mood because the, the person, the, the person we ought to show kindness to has been so terrible to us. But let us learn to love them and you know, I know it's not as easy as it seemed, but with God, we can do all things. We can express love by telling others how much we appreciate them. We can express love by simply doing things to make someone happy. We can express, that's a big one. Express God's love by spending time with people that we care about. We can express God's love by being empathetic. Ellen G. White says in Testimonies Volume 7, under the, 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 the reading, Power from on High, the chapter, she says, as God so liberally bestows his gifts on you, remember that it is in order that you may return them to the giver multiplied by being imparted. Bring into the lives of others light and joy and peace. Every day, she says, we need the, the discipline of self-humiliation that we may be prepared to receive the heavenly gift, not to hoard it, not to rob God's children of his blessings, but to give it in all its rich fullness to others. When, when more than now sh shall we need a heart open to receive, aching as it were with its longing to impart, we are in, we are in duty bound to draw largely from the treasure house of divine knowledge. God wants us to receive much in order that we may impart much. He desires us to be channels through which he can impart richly of his grace to the world. The third characteristic, God's love is non-compulsive and non-manipulating. God hates compulsion. God does not force anyone to enter into a relationship with him. He is offering and inviting, drawing us to himself. Compelling and manipulating persons to love us is cheating the principle of love. Why do I say so? Many times we do not spend time to nurture and groom relationships. Nonetheless, we want a certain result. When that is not seen, when that is not seen, we force or bully our way. This is not the way that God loves. 
God's love is not out of compulsion. God, he doesn't force us. And that's a reason for many, many broken relationships. Time is important. When we spend time with each other and we, we talk, we interact, we observe, we, we will learn about each other. And as we spend time and we learn, it will come naturally because we are actually nurturing and grooming and adding to that loving relationship. Jose 11.4, our, our passage, I drew them with gentle cords, with bands of love. Even when God draws his people, it is with gentle cords of love, not with harsh manipulation or coercion. God wants to win us over, but not with brute force. Understand. That, is true, that it is true that no man comes to God except he is drawn. But it is equally true that God draws no man contrary to the constitution of man. He finds a human mind, what it is, and he acts upon it. Not as upon matter, but as upon mind. The compulsions, the restraints, the cords that he uses are cords of and bands of love. God doesn't force others to love. He wins us over with love. That's a lesson, the final characteristics of God, characteristic of God's love. God's love is sacrificial. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the spirit through faith. Galatians 3, 13 and 14. What are we willing to put on that altar of sacrifice? God's love is sacrificial. God's love is expressive. God's love is from everlasting to everlasting. God's love is sacrificial. What are we willing to sacrifice this evening? What about time? Can we sacrifice some time so that our, our love relation can blossom? What about money? Can we sacrifice that? Our resources? What about our ego? Can we just lay that on the altar? What about our bad habits? It's, it's unfortunate that some, some, some adults will say, you know, that's how I was from since I was a boy and I'm changing now. I'm old and uh, you, uh, the tree normally is, is, is bent when it's young. I'm old and, and hard and, and firm in my ways. You cannot change it. What about sacrificing some bad habits so that we can express God's love in a tangible manner? Every committed, converted Christian must practice self-denial. And when I read that, I thought of the song in our hymnal, the hymn, sorry, 570. Not I, but Christ, be honored, love, exalted. Not I, but Christ, be seen, be known, be heard. Not I, but Christ, in every look and action. Not I, but Christ, in every thought and word. We are talking about God's self-sacrificing love that we are supposed to emulate. And the last two lines of the third stanza says, Christ only Christ, no self-important bearing. Christ only Christ, no trace of I be found. Last year in the third quarter, quarterly, uh, entitled Making Friends for God, Sab Sunday, September the 20th, the joy of sharing in the mission, talks about Jesus, Jesus' self-sacrifice and love. The essence of Jesus' thinking was sacrificial love, Sister White says. To follow Jesus means that we, we love as he loved. Serve 
as he served, a minister as he ministered, allowing, allowing Jesus through his Holy Spirit to empty us of selfish ambition. When we allow Jesus through his Holy Spirit to empty us of selfish ambition, we have nothing to lose. We have nothing to lose. It costs Jesus everything. But scripture says, therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Jesus laid everything down for us. Are we willing to lay something down for his love to be manifested? Heaven, Sister White says in that account, in that study, heaven will be worth any sacrifice we make on earth. Are you hearing me? Heaven will be worth any sacrifice we make on earth. There will be, no, there will be sacrifices along the way, but the joys of service will outweigh them today. And the eternal joy of living with Jesus throughout all eternity will make any sacrifice we make here seem insignificant. How deep is the Father's love for us? Can we fathom his love? How deep is his, the Father's love for us? Let's listen to this song as we go into the closing aspect of this message. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. What an amazing God we serve. Amen. How deep the Father's love for us. His wounds have paid the ransom. God loves us simply because he loves us. We, we cannot, ex, we, we cannot ex, explain the depth. We can hardly feel, but what we know for sure is that his love is from everlasting to everlasting. His love is, is patient and is kind. His love is deep. His love is stubborn. We don't have to work for his affection. We don't have to set ourselves straight before God can pour out his love over us the father in the prodigal son the father in the prodigal's story the father ran out to meet his son before anything had ever been in insight he didn't know his son was there to apologize he didn't know if he if he came to apologize he didn't care he simply wanted to love his child how deep the Father's love. Your Heavenly Father feels the same way about you. Our Heavenly Father feels the same way about us. He said, come let us reason. Why are we worried and, and downcast? Come let us reason. Yes, I know you have messed up. Don't even remind me about it. I love you nonetheless. God's love is, is magnetic. Let us, let us really think deep of the Father's love for us. God simply just wants to love us completely. If we just but allow him. Your Heavenly Father feels the same way. 
just like the father in the prodigal son. He longs to love us right where we are in whatever our situation is. He longs to fill us up with his love that overflows. He longs for us to experience this love and oneness, just as Jesus did when he walked the earth. Let us not be like Israel of old. Every time God drew them to himself, they turn their backs on him. Many times we listen to a good message and we attend, we, we attend many crusades and evangelistic campaigns and all kinds of series. And, 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 and we, we, we feel this, this inclination to, to step up higher in our spiritual lives. But then, then this bad habit seems to get the, the, better, the, the better hand, the better side of us. And, and like Israel of old, we, we turn our back on God's amazing love. The Lord says in verse 1, when Israel was a child, I loved him and called him out of Egypt as my son. But the more I called him, the more he turned away from me. My people sacrificed to Baal. They burnt incense to idols. Yet I was the one who taught Israel to walk. I took my people up in my arms, but they did not acknowledge that I took care of them. I drew them to me with affection and love. I picked them up and held them to my cheek. I bent down to them and fed them. They refused to return to me. Verse 7, they insist on turning away from me. They will cry out because of the yoke that is on them, but no one will lift it from them. How can I give you up? Christ is saying to us, how can I give up Israel? How can I abandon you? God wants to, to have us think of the reality of his love. God cannot abandon us. Then he refuses to be God if, that, if that's the case. How can I give you up, Israel? How can I abandon you? Could I ever destroy you as I did? Adma, or treat you as I did, Zimuim, my heart will not let me do it. God is saying to us this afternoon, I, I love you so intimately. I love you so unconditionally. So many times we repeat, so many times we, we repeat one particular sin over and over and over. And, and, and we, we need to know that after one time, is, one time is a mistake, the others not mistakes. You, you sort of what others would be, not mistakes anymore. But, but, but in spite of all that, God loves us. As a young person, I sang God's love is so high, you can't get over it. So low, you can't get under it. So wide, you can't get around it. You have to go through the door today. Jesus stands with a door ajar and saying, come my blessed child, come my blessed daughter, come my blessed son, I love you. I died for you. There is nothing that you can do that can cause me to love you less. What stubborn love? Oh, love that will not let me go. Aren't we thankful for God's love? Don't you want to reciprocate this love? Don't you want to share God's love? And so someone can come to know that Jesus can make a difference, a world of difference in their lives, in their situation. Is that your desire? Is it your heartfelt condition and conviction that you want God to so fill you up with his love, to share this love with others? A love that will change the way we, you think, the way we think. This afternoon, don't we want to, to reflect God's love? His love that is patient and from everlasting, 
God wants, to, God wants us to love like, like the way he loves to express our love and care for others. God wants us to exercise sacrificial love. God wants us to love completely. Is that your desire? If that is your desire, let us pray. Almighty God, hallowed be your name. We are thankful, oh God, that while we were yet deep in sin, rock bottom, you sent Jesus to lift us up from our fallen state and deplorable condition. We are grateful, oh God, for your love. And so we pray that you will shower this love afresh upon us. Fill our hearts with, with your love to overflowing that we can embrace others with your love. And oh God, because of not what we have done, but because of who you are and how much you love us, we pray that you will save us until you come, oh God. Keep us faithful so that when you shall burst the azure skies, you shall look down and say, well done, thy good and faithful servant, into the, into the joy of the Lord. Until then, oh God, keep us faithful and help us to embrace your love. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Amen. Amen.